A long time ago, in the village of Ezani, a land where traditions were rooted deep into the soil and laws of the ancestors were upheld with a sacred fervor. Begging was not an act that was encouraged, for it was believed that each man's fate was to be carved by his own hands. Yet, in this land of pride and self-reliance, a stranger wandered. His clothes were tattered, his feet bare, and his eyes held a depth of wisdom that could not be understood. His name was Obum, a beggar from a distant land. He sought for arms, but each plea was met with cold stares and harsh remarks. One day, as the sun was setting, Obum met a young lady who was on her way back from the market. Unlike the others, her heart was moved by the sight of the weary beggar. Stranger, she said, begging will bring you nothing but the king's wrath. Here, she offered him some fruits. Obum took the fruits and thanked her for her kindness, and she went along her way. After the sun set every night, and the village of Ezani slept, Obum the beggar would find solace under the ube tree, which stood at the entrance of the village market. Its white trunk and sprawling branches were like the arms of a gentle giant offering shelter and comfort. The next day, as the sun rose, Udo, with a basket of cassava and yams balanced on her head, made her way to the market. As she approached, she noticed a figure under the ube tree, a man staring from his slumber. The first rays of dawn casting a gentle glow upon his weathered face. Udo paused, realizing it was the poor beggar she had seen the day before, walked up to him. Good morning, she greeted, her voice a soft breeze in the stillness of a new day. I see the night has been kind to you. Abum looked up his eyes reflecting a gratitude that words could not convey. It has, thanks to the kindness of a stranger, he replied. Udo smiled, setting down her basket. Why is a healthy, able young man like you on the streets begging when you can be working to earn your living, she asked. The people haven't been too kind. No one will give me a job, he said. But you are willing to work? Of course, he replied, as soon as I get one. Okay then, said Udo, I will take you to see my father. He needs a hand on the farm. I'm sure he'll be willing to offer you a job. Thank you, Obum replied. May God bless you for your kindness towards a stranger. Udo brought out something that was wrapped in a piece of cloth from her basket. She unwrapped it and offered it to the stranger. It was a portion of fufu and soup. It is not much. But it is given with warmth, she said. She also handed him a flask of water. Obum accepted the gift, his hands trembling, not from hunger, but from the emotion that welled up within him. Your generosity knows no bounds, he said. Odo smiled. I'm glad I could be of help. What do I call you? She asked him. Obum. My name is Obum. Mine is Udo. I'll see you later in the evening. As she bent to lift her basket, Obum quickly moved, lifted the basket with so much ease and strength that shouldn't come from a hungry beggar living on the streets. Udo smiled, thanked him, and continued on her way. When Udo brought Obum the beggar to her father's compound, her father, Chief Ikenna, was taken aback. His eyes widened in disbelief as he beheld the stranger in tattered clothes standing before him. Chifikenna was a man of stature, known for his wisdom and adherence to tradition, and the sight of a beggar in his house was like a storm cloud over a clear sky. Udo, my daughter, he began, his voice a mix of concern and surprise. Why have you brought this man here? You know our customs well. Udo met her father's gaze, her resolve, as firm as the Iroko tree. Father, I have brought him because he is in need. Our lands are plentiful, 
and our bands are full. Surely we can offer him work on our farm. The chief stood and looked at his daughter, his thoughts, the whirlwind of emotions and tradition. To turn away a soul in need was against the very essence of humanity. Yet, to welcome a beggar into one's home was to invite whispers and judgment. And knowing his daughter, as stubborn and as daring as her mother, will not give in until he grants her request. After a long silence, Chifikenna stopped and faced Obum. Stranger, he said, I do not know your story, nor do I need to. My daughter sees something in you, and I trust her heart. You may work on my farm, but know this, you will be treated as any other worker, no less and no more. Obum bowed deeply. Thank you, Chifikenna. I ask for nothing but for the chance to prove my worth. So, Abun began working on the farm. Each passing day, he earned the respect of his fellow workers and the admiration of the chief, whose initial apprehension turned to pride. He had come to see that Abun was no ordinary man. His wisdom shone through his actions, and his leadership inspired those around him. As the days went by, Udo's relationship with Abun which began with simple acts of kindness and compassion, grew deeper with each sunrise and sunset. Udo found herself drawn to his quiet strength and his wisdom that seemed to dance in his eyes. She admired his dedication to the work on her father's farm and the respect he showed to all, regardless of who they were. Obum in turn was captivated by Udo's kindness and the way her laughter seemed to make the whole village brighter. People began to notice the change in the air, the glances as changed, and the smiles that lingered a little longer. Even Chief Ikena could see genuine affection growing between them, and he was worried. His worry stemmed from a place of deep love and concern for her future. One day, he sat down with Udo in the garden, his face marked by lines of worry with the weight of tradition and the duty he felt towards his lineage. Udo, my child, Chifikenna began, his voice carrying the gravity of the matter at hand. You know that your union with Prince Cheta has been arranged since you were both children. Its bond will unite our families and strengthen our village. Udo listened her heart torn between the expectations of her birthright and the love she had found. Father, I understand the importance of the alliance, she replied. But my heart does not beat for Prince Cheta. You have known that right from time. I always made it clear. Prince Cheta is a good man, and he will be king one day, and you, my daughter, queen. But I have no desire to be queen, she said. Udo... Prince Cheta is a good man, and with time, you will grow to love him. With that said, Chifikenna got up. Prepare for your visit to Nri. You will leave in two days. Chifikenna walked away. Prince Cheta was the heir to the neighboring kingdom, Nri, a land rich in culture and resources. His father, King Obina, had long been an ally of Chief Ikenna and their kingdoms had prospered through trades and mutual support. Chief Ikenna was a revered figure in Ezani. He was not of royal blood, but his lineage was one of great respect and influence. His counsel was sought by many, and his decisions shaped the future of the village. Udo's marriage to Prince Cheta was not a matter of royal lineage, but of strategic alliance. Her union with Prince Cheta was a symbol of deep trust and friendship between Chief Ikenna and King Obina of Nri. It was a promise of unity, ensuring that the bonds between Ezani and Nri would remain unbreakable, bringing stability and prosperity to both lands. When Udo arrived in Nri, the air was full with anticipation. Prince Cheta awaited her at the palace gate. She had not seen him since they were children, and now 
their union was meant to bind their kingdoms. Her thoughts stayed with Obum. His memory lingered like the scent of rain on dry earth. Prince Jeta greeted her with a smile, his eyes assessing her every move. Udo, he said, you have grown into a vision of grace. Udo bowed in greeting. Prince Jeta, the honor is mine. Rumors like wildfire had reached Henry of Udo's friendship with a beggar. Some spoke of love, others spoke of scandal. Prince Jeta's eyes held questions, but he chose diplomacy over curiosity. Our union is not just for our hearts, but for our people. The prosperity of Unri and Ezani rests upon our shoulders. She nodded. I understand, Prince Jeta, but love cannot be commanded like an army. It blooms where it wills. Prince Jeta stopped, looked at her and said, And where does your heart bloom, Udo? In a place where kindness knows no boundaries, she replied, her voice barely audible. Prince Jeta smiled and said, Then let us build a kingdom where love and duty walk hand in hand. Prince Jeta too carried secrets, the weight of tradition, and what he knew was threatening to drown him. Two days after Udo arrived in Ri, Prince Jeta sat her down for a talk in the garden. There are whispers in the corridor. They speak of a beggar, a man who has captured your heart. Udo's eyes met his for a moment. The world narrowed to just the two of them. My prince, rumors are like wind. They blow where they will, but they do not define the truth. Is there truth in these whispers? Have you given your heart to another? Udo hesitated, then said, Obum is a man of kindness, but my duty lies here with you and our kingdoms. Duty, he echoed. What about desire? Desire is a tempest that defines reason. Love, Prince Chita, is a force that shapes destinies, she said. And what destiny do you choose, Udo? The beggar or the prince? Udo met his gaze and said, I choose love, whether it wears the cloak of the beggar or the robes of royalty. Prince Chita took Udo's hand, the weight of the truth he had carried like a gem, bringing down his walls. There's a secret that binds me to our alliance, one that is threatening to drown me. Udo's heart skipped. What secret, Prince Chita? He glanced around as if the walls had ears. I am not the true heir of Henri's throne, he confessed. My elder brother, Ikemifuna, was meant to wear the crown. But he vanished few days before his seventh birthday. Udo's breath caught. Vanished? But how? No one knows what happened. We just woke up one morning and realized he was missing. I was six years old when it happened. His mother, my stepmother, could not recover from the ordeal. She died a few years later. It broke my father to pieces. Our kingdom's alliance had already been formed. My father didn't want to renege on the agreement, and the elders insisted on stability. So, being that I was the next in line for the throne, I took his place. Udo was dumbfounded by the truth that had been revealed to her. For a long time, both of them said nothing. Then Udo broke the silence and said, do you believe he's still out there? Alive? Prince Jeta nodded. I do. Ikemefuna's spirit was too bright to be extinguished. After five days in Uri, Udo returned home to Ezani. She was very glad and thankful that Prince Jeta had told her the truth. She couldn't remember what Ikemefuna or Cheta looked like. She only saw them once when she was five years old. As she stepped into her father's compound, the first face she saw was Obum's face. It broke into a smile, 
wide and true, the kind that reaches the eyes and lights up the soul. Udo, he said, you have returned. Udo walked up to him. Oh, boom, I have missed you more than words can tell. Udo shared tales of Henry and its people with him. All of a sudden, Obum went silent. It bothered Udo, so she asked, What is the problem, Obum? Why are you downcast? Udo, he said, How can a heart divided beat with a rhythm of true love? She took Obum's hands in hers and said, Obum, my heart has never wavered. It beats for you alone. For us, our love is the river that flows against the odds, carving its own path. It was a promise of hope, a testament to the courage of two hearts that chose to beat as one. Then she asked him, You have never spoken of a family. Do you have one? Not that I can remember, he said. I was a child when fate left me at the doorstep of a humble widow. She had little to her name but raised me as her own. He smiled. But the villagers, they hated her. They called her a witch, said she killed her husband and two children. I tried to do menial jobs at a young age, but no one would give me a chance. They said I was infected with witchcraft too. After she died, the villagers treated me like a leper. I decided there was no need to remain in a place where I wasn't wanted. So I left. Everywhere I went, I couldn't seem to find favor. Nothing until I met you. Udo listened until he finished. She held his face in his hands and said, Yet you wear your past, not as a shackle, but as wings. You have reason, Obum. Chifikena's compound was busy with activities. People coming and going putting in place one thing or the other. King Obina and his son, Prince Jeta, will be visiting the king of Ezani to discuss politics and the way forward. They would also be paying Chifikena a visit to finalize marriage plans. Prince Jeta had earlier sent Udo a message saying that they would inform their parents of their decision to break their engagement. Upon their arrival, they found Obum in the company of Adese, his presence as unassuming as ever. Yet, as King Obina's gaze fell upon Obum, a flicker of recognition sparked in his eyes. He stepped closer, studying Obum's features. Could it be? King Obina murmured. Prince Jeta, observing his father's bewilderment, looked upon Obum with curiosity. The rumors of a beggar were the heart of a king suddenly weaving into place. Father, Prince Jeta said, do you know this man? King Gobina approached Obum. His demeanor softened. Many years ago, I lost a son, he said. A son who would have been king, who had the same fire in his eyes as you do. Abu met the king's gaze. I was raised by a widow, a kind soul who taught me the value of life's simple gifts. Of my life before her, I remember little. Udo watched the unraveling. Her heart caught between joy and apprehension. Could Abu, the man she loved, be the missing prince of Henri? King Gobina placed a hand on Abu's shoulder and said, if you are indeed my son, Ikemefuna, know that your place in Enri has always awaited your return. He invited Obum, Udo, and Chifikena to visit Enri the next day. It was an old nursemaid, loyal to the royal family of Enri, who held the key. With hands trembling from age, she stepped forward. There's a way to know for certain, she said. Her voice a whisper of times gone by. The prince, Ikemefuna, was born with a mark, a birthmark, like the shape of a crescent moon, hidden beneath his left shoulder. Obum, with cautious hands, 
drew back his garment to reveal his shoulder. And there, against his skin, was the mark, pale but distinct, a silent testament to his royal birth. Then a memory long buried in the depths of Obum's mind. I remember a lullaby, Obum said. A lullaby my mother sang to me, of stars and promises of moons and love eternal. The nurse maid's eyes filled with tears as Obun hummed the melody, a tune that had lured the infant prince to sleep. You are Ikemefuna, the lost son of Unri. King Obina embraced Obum, tears of joy pouring down his face. Prince Jeta stood. His brother was found. His heart was full of questions yet to be asked. And Udo, her love vindicated, smiled through tears of happiness. Shifikena bowed slightly, a gesture of respect and acknowledgement. He approached Ikemefuna and placed a firm hand upon his shoulder. My daughter saw in you what we failed to see. A king's heart within a beggar's chest. You have brought honor to our village, not by the crown you were born to wear, but by the character you chose to embody. The mystery of life is its ability to surprise us, to teach us that beneath the surface lies the truth of one's spirit. If you enjoyed the story today, then give it a like. Let me know in the comment sections what you learned from the story. And you can also share this video with those you think will enjoy it too. I want to say a big welcome to my new subscribers. Thank you for supporting this channel. I really appreciate you. I'll see you guys in my next story. Bye.